<laughs> some kind of <laughs> some kind of warm up to tip of the tongue, the teeth, and the lips. That's it. Tip of the tongue, teeth, and the lips. Susie sucks saggy sex. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> Susie works for the retirement home. <laughs> Been recording for this now already. Like Susie we are... sucks saggy sex, subsequently spreading syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> Susie sucks saggy sacks, subsequently making her the super spreader. I've got this burning sensation when I, I pee. Oh, oh, baby. baby. <laughs> I got a damn good feeling you're the one who what gave it to me. me. <laughs> I got creepy. <laughs> right. I don't know what I'm using the intro. It's been, we got four minutes already of this shit. That I've recorded, like it's just gonna, it's gonna be great. Well, hey guys, what's going on here? River Sullivan coming at you right here, right now, pre-recorded yet again, live on the airfield for your. Pre-recorded pleasure. I think that was a race car. Uh, I know, but it just made me think of like a P fifty one. Like, it's like, <laughs> oh god, they're here <laughs> for another episode of season five of this evening tonight. And with me here, yet again, my man with that Zen Buddhist monk like patience, the smoky smokiness of Charlton Heston himself and his love of the American dream. Dave. It's me. Get oh. your hands off me, you damn dirty <laughs> Sullivan. <laughs> so yeah, guys, it's that time here yet again to sit back, relax, crack open a cold one, and listen to another hour long of the Buell shit. So you might notice the audio here is a little bit different here. We just kind of had a little bit of change of location for this week. Uh, we are now recording at Casa de Dave. In what I can only refer to as his underground lair. Bill Cummin. <laughs> Welcome to the bunker, yeah. <laughs> Would you like some schnitzels? What? A, are, okay, I gotta ask. You are of German descent, right? Super German descent. I, I was about to say, fuck, I hope so, because like you had the German Steins, you're much better at speaking German than I am. <clears throat> and your love of the dark beers. It was all things, but yeah. weren't you know wondering about your last name? I was like, is that, is that German? Is that German? I, don't know. I thought maybe you're one of those guys that took German in high school and was like, you know what? I'm German. Oh, I, I'm I'm very German. Which is ironic because as for you as a man of German descent, there's never one I've seen with more conviction and want to punch a Nazi in the fucking face. I hate Nazis. <laughs> it always makes me think of the Blues Brothers, where they're you know they're sitting in the car and the roads blocked and they're like going on here? You know, what's the road? He's like, oh, they're fucking Nazis. And they're like, Illinois Nazis. <laughs> I hate Illinois Nazis. I think I need to, to make the conscious decision to, to actually start calling them Nazis. Like Brad Pitt. In Fury, in, yeah. In, in, in Glorious Bastards. Oh, Gonna okay. kill some Nazis. Oh, yeah, okay. Because I don't even want to say Nazi right. That's right. I don't even li- I don't like them. You just want to be so American, German-American that you just want to alliterate the fuck Nazis. out of it. Nazis. Be like, yeah, that's right. I'm, 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 I'm versed enough to know the difference, but uh, you know what? I'm alliterating for the sake of it because I fucking can. Why? Freedom, America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's not get it twisted here. Though we're talking about like actual Nazis, like the guys, any dude walking around with an SS and just running that pure, unadulterated ignorance. I want to punch him in the throat, like right, uh, right in the throat. You ever throat punch somebody? Uh, not, not with a fist. No. You don't want to kill people. I mean, you you can do it with a fist, but it, you just gotta you gotta know just the right amount of oomph to put behind it. The best way to do it is to rabbit punch them with an open hand, the the crook oh, between yeah. your thumb and your index finger, right above the Adam's apple. <laughs> yeah, engage. And they, they make that weird noise. Like, <laughs> yeah, generally it it'll engage the uh, gag reflex. And, allegedly, uh, yeah. allegedly, we we do not condone. I anything. I've heard Nazis don't actually have gag reflexes. So. <laughs> I have yet to, to find out. <laughs> but, uh, I'm yet to find out where the fuck we're going with this show today, but I always like to be along for the ride. Like, it's a good 
Sometimes I'm driving, sometimes you're driving. Most times we're just a passenger, we turn the, the old truck on cruise control and let go of the wheel. Because that's how cruise control works. Well, I guess uh, we can go ahead and tell them we're here in my garage because uh, I'm trying to get off of a certain medication. And uh, the withdrawing is making it very difficult for me to exist mm. and drive and do stuff. So we're here so I didn't have to drive all the way up to the uh, the Sullivan Sullivan Ranch. Yeah, the old <laughs> homestead up there. So uh, mind if I ask, like, what do you what's what's withdrawal like coming off of PTSD med? Well, it's an antidepressant and anti-anxiety medication that I was taking called venlafaxine, which is the generic form of Effexor. And I've been on probably eight different antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications for this over the, the past 15 years. And every time you come off of one, it's similar to having the flu except uh, like every time you move your head or move your eyes like when anytime you have to refocus on something mm -hmm. you get lightheaded almost like uh, it, it's a zap almost like an, an electric jolt in your head oh I know that feeling like, like and that's that's actually a very astute way of putting it was like with the flu yeah it's not like when you look you get a little burp, burp, like it's yeah, weird it, it's it makes it very difficult to drive. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple years ago, I, I ran out of my medicine, and I was driving down to Clarksburg, West Virginia, to the VA down there to the emergency room to try to get some medication, and I, I about ran a man off the road. I had, I had no idea he was there. I couldn't look. felt really bad about it. I just remember that was uh, also the home of Feta. Serial killer. Oh, cool. She, uh, yeah. well, she took out seven or eight. I think they're now linking I, her to a, well, I think upwards they, of a dozen now. I, I think that they uh, convicted her of seven or eight. I, I think that would kind of pled down to that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that they think that uh, she was responsible. I think they definitely think for more. Yeah, I, I'm surprised she didn't take a offered plea. Oh or, no, I'm sure she got. She's she's going to get a book deal and a movie out of it. I'm sure. Well, she can't make any money off of it. Is, no, is a thing, but uh, her family can. Oh, yeah. Um, a lot of uh, angel of death syndromes in places like that when you're just surrounded by old, weaker people suffering. Feel like you've got the power to... She was killing them with what? Uh, insulin, I think. Insulin, yeah. They go into a uh, diabetic coma. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to trace. And if you're not looking for, for something in a talk screen, and I don't think insulin is going to be in a talk screen, you have to look for it. You have to measure all the, the blood, you know, all the levels in the blood. And once a, a body is laying around for so, you know, for so many hours and mm -hmm. you're taking blood, that stuff has a half-life in, in your blood. So so we digress. Getting back into it, though, like you were talking about, you almost ran somebody off the road because you had zip-zap going on in your head. Yeah, couldn't uh, couldn't check my blind spot. Yeah. Because I would have passed out. It, it was it was it was really really bad. So I it go, was that debilitating. Yeah. No shit. It's not that bad right now, but it, it's still bad enough. I haven't really been able to do much. So what other? Because okay, so this just kind of hit me here. As as you know, uh, we kind of set up here with no real clue as to what we were going to talk about, which is again, you know how I like to do things. Generally, I, I like to talk about my favorite subject. Which is you. Which and is me. So, to stick on the subject of you, are you subjugating yourself to the kind of questioning like for something like this, that I believe that your disclosure of all your side effects and feelings on it, and in not really the market, but the audience that we have, would reach out with this information to veterans or families of veterans that they have somebody going through this, that they could use it go hey are you going through this and this and they go oh yeah you know it mm -hmm. gives families and loved ones with with a loved one or a friend that's that's a veteran going through this a kind of sense of knowing where say you or them or whoever would be at you down with that i i don't know if i really pick up on what what the question was 
Meaning I want you um, to discuss all the side effects and everything and everything openly to the point to where when our listeners hear this. I, I'm open about it. Yeah. I okay, mean, if, yeah. Any, any questions that anybody might have, I'll, because I'll, I'll do everything. I'm I fully to. cognizant and aware of all the issues that go on with veterans, or I try to be. But that little the zap thing in the head, never knew about that. Yeah, it, it's, it's pretty bad. And it can be months before yeah. it goes away. So what else? Well, those are the the main ones. Is the zip zap the zip zap say in the? I I've all, I've been just like incredibly thirsty. Mm-hmm. Can't seem to drink enough water. Doesn't matter how many beers or scotches I drink. I, I'm just so thirsty <laughs> all the time. Um, I know you're fucking with me on that one. <laughs> no, it it. it Truly, I'm just always very, very thirsty. I know, I'm just stating because you know like alcohol a, is a diuretic yeah, and all that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, kind of just feeling like you're running a low-grade fever the, in, the entire time you're awake. And the only time you feel better is if you just sit, don't move, and basically just breathe for a few minutes. And the, things will go back to normal but as soon as you're moving your head around moving your arms legs even if you're sitting it it sucks pretty bad I'm not gonna lie to you that right there is for me almost identical to when I was recovering from COVID was was the feelings I would have that I couldn't breathe and center and I would just literally have to stand there and breathe and it would take minutes Mm -hmm. it would feel like forever but uh, I would recover from that well I definitely don't have the Rona uh, well, I'm glad. <laughs> um, this is something I, I've brought upon myself because I'm a glutton for many things. Uh, food, booze, punishment. Fast cars, loose women, you know? Yeah. You're not first, you're last. Metaphorically, right, Ricky metaphorically Mrs. Dave. Um, <laughs> my medicine, uh, I was reaching a point with, I guess you, you'd call it diminishing returns. That the, Like a uh, tolerance? Yeah, the benefits weren't were no longer outweighing the side, the, the side effects of the medicine, so which can be interesting. Uh, my doctor and I decided it was time to try something else, which means that I have to wean off of this the medication that I've been taking. Mm-hmm. And any you know advice to anybody that's taking these types of like SSRIs or SNRIs, selective serotonin, uh, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, do not just stop taking them and do not run out. (laughs) (laughs) Cold turkey is never a good good option for that. I know that. In some cases, it can kill you. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it can cause permanent lasting neurological effects you have to wean yourself off these things so basically when you're coming off of this type of medication it's about managing the side effects of the withdrawal Mm -hmm. while still coming like stepping down on on your dosing but I was on the, the maximum they could give me for my body weight which is I'm proud to say substantial I was taking uh, 225 milligrams a day of uh, like extended release, so I, yeah, I guess it it doesn't really matter. But the first step was 30 percent less than that. And that's a big jump. Mm-hmm. And after a week, I was from 225 milligrams to 75 milligrams. All right. And that's when shit started to get real weird. <laughs> uh, really fast yeah and like I could wake up and feel okay but within about 20 minutes of being awake once like my metabolism started you know waking up and getting going it was rough real rough what do you mean just the uh, just feeling like a low grade fever flu flu like symptoms the zip zaps I would wake up and feel okay but once I'm up and moving around, my blood starts going, get, you know, waking up a little bit. The side effects are just like 
very much up front and center. So other than the zip zap and low grade fever, was, was there anything else that you were feeling going through that or? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a thousand things, but it's, it's cloudy and my mind's cloudy. So it's mm -hmm. maybe in a few weeks, I could probably tell you better, but I don't know. That's definitely not myself. Yeah. Well, I know that, uh, I got, uh, I, one of my brothers, uh, was on some PTSD medication. I don't, don't ask me what kind, cause I don't know, but I know he was on two or three different ones till they could find him the right one. And he said that the worst part was for like all of them. And I guess he, he's off of them now mm -hmm. and has been off. Um, if you can find a way to manage without the medication, my hat's off to you. Well, for him, it was definitely supportive family structure. I mean, it was, he's got three kids and a wife, and his wife is probably one of the strongest people I've met, that she has been a rock to him for I don't know how long. But what little bit he did tell me was when he was on those meds, he hated it. Like, he's like, yeah, I didn't have nightmares, I didn't have anxiety anymore, but I didn't have joy, I didn't have anger, I didn't have any of it. He said, I was just numb. He said, I didn't feel anything. I said, yeah, I was... I was alive and I wasn't causing any problems for anybody, but I wasn't anything. He, he just said he was walking around, felt hollow. Mm -hmm. I can I can guess what he was on. Yeah. And I'm going to guess Trazodone right off the bat. I think that might have been it. Yeah, because if that's the probably the most commonly prescribed one, prescribed one yeah. for PTSD. And that's the one that uh, the Army gave me. And that was the first time I was ever late to, a, to any formation was... The first time I was uh, on Trazodone, and I whole, wholly agree with uh, with your brother's uh, testimony of that medication. I, I felt like a zombie. Yeah, and that's what he said too. It, it's like your body's basically autonomous, and you're just like kind of stuck you're not in your head. Yeah, yeah, it, it was terrible. I was I was lucky for the PTSD that I had. Um... I went and saw one staff psychologist when I was in the military, and they gave me the rundown on everything. And I, I mean, we, we talked about it. I resorted to alcohol years ago for that, and like too much to where I had become like an alcohol dependent. And I had to wean myself off that. Like going cold turkey for a while, like kind of worked, but then you start getting the sweats and the shakes, and you're like, oh God, you know, it's, it's bad. But. For any of my PTSD, the, the only thing that for me that, that truly helped was I had to learn for things that I had seen or whatever that talking for me is what really helped and also to embrace the fact that it happened. Like there were things that that had happened that I never wanted to believe I was there for, a part of, anything. Mm -hmm. yep. And... It's it's easier said than done. Just say, well, you just got to fucking embrace the fact you did it. Well, it's not. I I know for a fact it was one of the hardest things I ever had to get over in my head. And that's where I embrace compartmentalization a lot. And that's not to lock things away. That's to help me sort things. One at a time in somewhat of an or orderly fashion. Because it used to, I used to get overwhelmed. I used to get overwhelmed and frantic. And it was the worst part of that for me at the time when I was going through that was I was living alone. Yeah, that and that would definitely be left rough. alone with my thoughts. I didn't have a, I didn't have a, a a pet anything, and I went through some really rough times there. And it was uh, I almost went over the edge one night, and uh, my mom was the one that uh, intervened and uh, stepped in and got me out of my thoughts. Might have involved her shouldering in the door to my apartment that I was in, <laughs> but. Uh, She's uh, I, I take she after her. She's she's uh, she's a tall lady. She's over six feet. Like uh, I'm glad she did it. She uh, she breached the door. <laughs> I was like, my God, they should have had you on room clearing in Iraq. Like, yeah. <laughs> she, she's got shoulders. <laughs> but I think the the most important part of it is finding a therapeutic way to be able to confront these things so that you can realize that it's okay. Mm -hmm. It was okay then. It's okay now. You know, people doing what they have to do it sucks mm -hmm. and it's terrifying and it's extremely hard to get over and this is where I'm at I'm at the point where I realize at this point 
my problem is that I will not forgive myself. Yeah. I will not look back at it without regret. Regret. Yeah. And it's, it's something I, I can't change. The only thing I can change is change the way I look at it and the way I face the future. But for some reason, I will not do that for myself. I'm, a, like I said, a glutton for punishment. I call that dirt bra- uh, dirtbag brain. Yeah. And it's that happens to, I, I know that happens to me, and I guarantee that happens to a lot of people, even without PTSD. Lying awake at 3 o'clock in the morning, and your brain's like, you know, you're like, hey, I just want to go to sleep. But your brain's going, hey. Remember that shit remember, you did remember in third grade? Remember that shit you did? Like, <laughs> years, let's think about all the things that you regret. Why remember, not? Remember I'm how, not doing anything right now. You? No. Oh, you sleep? Uh, no, don't worry. No, I control it. No, you're good. Remember how embarrassing that was? You remember how you called this woman such and such? And Oh, my God. You're so terrible. <laughs> yeah. Nobody loves you. Oh, thank you, brain. I really appreciate that. But no, it's... Uh, so I would have nights like that. I'd have days like that where I'd be in my waking moments, not even tired, that I would be consumed with, with guilt from, from my stuff. And guilt and worry. And, like, and it's, it's... The TV shows and the movies don't lie to you. They do, they do nail this right in things that I've heard on the old TV box and moving pitches about things is... It's it's like a cut. It's it's an infection. If you let it fester, it'll take over and poison your body and poison your soul. Well, every time you think about it in in those circumstances where you're feeling the regret, the the anxiety, hatred, embarrassment, what, mm-hmm. whatever is surrounding uh, these these moments that that bring you this much distress. Every time you're viewing that in in your mind. With that emotion, you're further concreting the neural pathways mm-hmm. that you're using to think about it. Yeah. And breaking out of that cycle is incredibly difficult. It, it takes it takes serious discipline. And there are a few of a few really great uh, therapies that you can use. Uh, one of them that I like is called uh, imagery rehearsal therapy. So if you, like, for, for instance, I have nightmares almost every night. Uh, if I have a particular nightmare that seems to be recurring or, or a, th- a theme, basically you, you write it down. You write it down a bunch of times, and then you write, you write it a bunch of times with a completely different ending. Mm-hmm. And you think about it every time you write that with a different ending. And I've noticed that since doing that, these very specific recurring nightmares that I've had have been ending differently. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever considered things like uh, training for lucid dreaming with that? Because I I used to have recurring nightmares uh, a long time ago. And it was one of the most profound experiences I'd ever had in my life when I learned how to lucid dream. Mm -hmm. So if you know you're going to have these nightmares, when you know that you're starting to fall asleep or pass out or whatever... Concentrate on an object is what I was told was to create an object in your mind. Mine was like a red ball, like something simple, something though that stands out in color, juxtaposed to that of whatever environment it is that you're dreaming. So, are you talking about a totem? Uh, maybe not a totem, but it was just something to get you get your brain to recognize that you could okay. you could do it over and over again in your head, and then when you dream, that would be one of the last things in your head, and then eventually it popped into a dream I was having. And I saw it, and I'll never forget it. And once you see it, you realize you're in control of the... Exactly. Yeah, it's a totem. And the moment, Dumb though, ass. you... Whatever. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, the moment you take control... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm the sorry. moment you take control, I'll never forget waking from that dream. And this happened over 12 years ago. And waking from that dream, like, I wasn't in a cold sweat. I wasn't scared. My heart was racing, but it was... To me, it was like that first feeling when the old lady took me whitewater rafting and that first cold wave hit me and I was wide awake and I knew that going down this, these rapids in that river that mm-hmm. could have been either the little, literal rapids of the river or the ones metaphorically used for a dreamscape was only I'm in control. This river's going one way, but I can steer it. I can, I can control which way it goes, left or right. It's just like life. I mean, we're all going one way in life. Yeah, there's only one thing for certain for us at the end of the road. And what we do before we get there 
that's where I realized for me it was during those dreams and my ability to steer that was I was tired of looking back and thinking on all the stuff that had terrorized me to be able to look ahead and go that's my journey another race car yeah. <laughs> that's my journey that's my destination it's just to get to the end whatever it is but to be in control and know that you're only in limited control so I know I'm not in control as to what it's at the end. I know that I'm going there no matter what. Some people control how soon they get to the end. I prefer that not to happen. But the choices we make along the way and how we view our journey, I'd rather spend that because when I was rafting, I didn't, I hardly ever look back to think, think about, oh, I should have done that better, should have done this better. To just focus on the present and the future to not let what's behind you hold you back to, you know, what's behind you hold you behind. I feel like uh, in, in my head this sounded very meta, so I don't know how it came out. I was going to say that we are at great risk of sounding like a bunch of fucking dirty hippies. Well, there's no weed involved, so. <laughs> um, how long from when you first started trying to get into lucid dreaming did it take you... To, to achieve some control. I want to say it was a couple months. A couple months. I, I used to um, I used to lucid dream naturally all the time. When I was a kid, I used to be able to. Uh, from my probably freshman year in high school uh, on through until I was about 22, so right before I got out of the Army, I was always lucid dreaming. Mm -hmm. um, it had more to do with I believe the level and depth of my sleep mm -hmm. because I was uh, an insomniac yeah um, so I, I would dream but I, I never I would never really reach that uh, that real deep deep sleep mm -hmm. uh, I was up all night I was I, I, for years I had this problem where I would get up five minutes before my alarm clock and then a week later I'd get I'd, get, I'd start getting up ten minutes before my alarm clock and sometimes that's nice like your body I, naturally I, will train itself to I, wake I up. wish I had that still because now I sleep through my alarm clock my wife's alarm clock snooze buttons mm -hmm. timers fire alarms well I had uh, recently as of about it was just a week ago I was starting to have trouble sleeping and I couldn't figure out why I'd wake up every night I'd go to bed at around two o'clock in the morning it's just because the shift I'm on I'm naturally up. Right. I could go to bed around midnight and be okay but normally I, I have to wait until my body and my mind is, is ready to go so I'm usually sitting there watching some Netflix till about two o'clock in the morning and I usually wake up at uh, nine you know maybe ten o'clock because I work a p.m. shift currently mm -hmm. but I go to bed at two and wake up exactly at 5 a.m. Like, I get three hours of sleep, and then I just, I'm like, my brain would just snap, and I'm wide awake. And I'm like, mm, okay. So I'd be like, I'd go to the kitchen, get a drink of water, and think, oh, maybe I'm just thirsty. No, yeah, don't really have to go to the bathroom. And just, I'd go back to bed and just struggle to get back to sleep. And then I'd pass out finally after an unknown amount of hours, and then sleep in by two hours, and just couldn't figure it out. Like, I I was talking to the old lady. She said, what's, what's going on with you? She said, I don't know. Like, and I was like, you were telling me with, with the issues you were having with sleep was, it was almost an anxiety thing going on and I couldn't figure out what it was. Like I was starting to have anxiety of like, fuck, am I going to get good sleep tonight? Cause I was tired of being tired at my job where I, that's the one place I don't want to be tired at. Like you mess up a job there and it just, things can go bad. Well, so for me, it ended up, it, I figured it out. I take coffee with me to work, I take a big thermos that holds a pot. And I usually share that with my coworkers. That's why I bring it, just because I like to share it. But I'll have three or four cups throughout my shift, and I get off at around 9 p.m. at night. Mm -hmm. And I treat my coffee as my own version of pre-workout. Because all I drink like at work is coffee and water. When I'm at home, it's usually coffee and water and some adult beverages. But I hadn't gone, for me, I hadn't gone to the gym at all that week. We had stuff going on. I just I wasn't really feeling it, but I was still enjoying my coffee. 
So you weren't you know, working off any of that. Wasn't working off the energy. caffeine. Well, it was also like there was a couple of days I went without the caffeine and it still had the same issue. She's like, you need to go, you know, what, what's going on? Well, at so, that point, it could be just caffeine withdrawal. Yeah, yeah. But I went back to drinking my coffee here this last week, but I made sure for the last five days at work, I went to the gym. And that was for me. Like, I'm not saying that's it's not a panacea for everybody. It's. Just for me, the thing that I've learned when I was having an issue reminded me when I first was going through PTSD. And I had not, I, I didn't only have to wear down my mind to go to sleep. I had to wear down my body. And exercising for me, not only good for your health, and it was something I wanted to do just for me, but it gave me a sense of accomplishment at the end of the day. Not, on, not only, hey, you just did your whole shift, and you worked out for almost an hour, and then I went home and I had that nice little pre or post workout high, had a little little dinner, had me a couple adult beverages, and just sleep like a baby. Like, if my mind's ready to sleep but my body isn't, I've learned that it's messed up. I don't know. I could definitely get on board with that. I've got workout machines. I I don't use them. I look at them a lot. <laughs> uh, it's really, it's really uh, about making the choice to. I don't have to go to the gym. Mm-hmm. I've got what I need here at, at my house. I just don't use it. You find I, yourself. I think about it a lot. It's like, oh, I should, I should go do that. I should do that. And then I'm like, and you're like, nah. Oh, dude, I struggled with that for years. Yeah. Well, that's just depression in a nutshell. Knowing, knowing yeah. what you, knowing what you should do, knowing what you need to do, even things you want to do. Mm-hmm. You don't do them. All right, so you want to know how I got over my hump to no. finally start? Well, I'm going to no, tell you anyway. I'm going to ear rape well, you. Right I, I need to say something here Okay, well, you say it. Before we move on. Uh-huh. Um, the waking up in the middle of the night is actually, it's very natural for humans. Really? Uh, before the advent of electronic lighting, electric lighting, fancy electric uh, light bulbs, and alarm clocks and, and the such, um... We were very much, I believe it's called diurnal. Mm-hmm. Um, you, know, you, you tend to go to sleep shortly after sundown. And then uh, most people would wake up somewhere around midnight. And they'd stay up for an hour, two hours, and go back to bed. Um, and like, it, I'm pretty sure it's called diurnal. But uh, I think it comes down to almost like a pack... Uh, mentality where check for predators. You, you wake up and you check for predators and you go back to sleep. Come to think of it, when I first moved into the house, I used to do that. I used to wake mm-hmm. up in the middle of the night and do the rounds. Yeah, it's, it's perfectly <laughs> natural for I do a little night patrol and go uh, back to bed. So yeah, I just wanted to mention that there's actually uh, some pretty interesting uh, psychology involved with that, I guess. No, absolutely, I believe that. Uh, Okay, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to mention that. Uh, cause no, you, no, you were, definitely, because now yeah. you're, you're telling me that. I promise you tonight when I go to sleep and I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm like, Predator. Patrol. <laughs> <laughs> Start doing some room clearing. <laughs> and then gingerly hop back in the bed. But no, it was... So, I knew that I had to make changes in my life. Right? And I know that you know that you have to make them too. We all, we all know... We all are very aware of things that we need to do. And the hardest part for most people, I'm not even going to attempt to make up any kind of statistic. It's just a natural fact that I guarantee you, if you're listening to this show and we've had this question, you're probably going, yeah, I know I need to do X, Y, and Z. We all know we need to do it. Like, I know I got to cut the grass. I know I got to do this. I got to do that. But for me, it was, I know or knew that I was like, man, I got to drop some weight because I just felt sluggish. I was tired. I was even more depressed than I should have been. Uh, PTSD not even taken into account. And I would look at myself in the mirror and just like I would get down. Like, I was to the point where I would joke with people say, look, I don't even take my shirt off in the shower. You know? <laughs> wow. But it's like every little thing that I do muster the energy for like every other day when I actually make the bed. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> as stupid as it is, it's like a small victory. There's something about you making know? a bed that 
gives you just a little bit of satisfaction. Yeah, the thing it. is, I don't want to. I don't want like, to either. I, I, I know, I know it has to be done. I know I should do it. My my wife loves when I do the little things like that, mm-hmm. so she doesn't have to do it. And I think about it, and then I just getting myself to do something as mundane and easy mm. as making the goddamn bed. <laughs> So, okay, so for to go back to this here real quick, too, was the choice I made to get myself into better shape did not even really occur truly for me to the level that I'm at now up until when I met my old lady. And it's not like, oh, I want to have like a raging six pack and, you know, look good for it. I do want to look good for it, don't get me wrong. But I look at the life that I'm building with it. And I go, all this shit, all this work that I'm doing, what's it going to fucking matter if I'm not around in 10 years, you know, because I don't take care of myself. And that helped to kind of galvanize me a little bit. But also it was like, I enjoy the life that I have with her. And I want to be around to enjoy that life further. To, to be able to take something as a joint life. Like, I mean, you guys are already married. So, I mean, you know, you're in that joint life. Yeah. You're, in, yeah, it, we're fucked. you're in the team, you know, it's... Ne- never a you and I. It's not. It's not a me thing. It's a us thing, and that helped me to where I was doing a little bit, but I always would kind of you know here and there. But I, I can't really explain it other than in my head. I was just. I told myself, so just go do it. Like in in the moment, like in the moment. I didn't go. Yeah, look, I, I'm gonna go after work. I need to do this now. Like. I have days yeah. like that. You found in your relationship, you have found purpose. Well, it's for me. It's like I said. It's it was a thing that I did for me, but I helped justify it and helped motivate me. And go, I'm going to do it for her too, to help get myself healthy. And it really only started even before that was just the notion of just go do it. Like I was driving home and we got a gym at work. I said, yeah, fuck it pulled off. I had gym clothes in, in my vehicle for I don't know how long. I said, you know what? Do it. Just didn't even didn't even give myself enough time to have a have a retroactive argument with myself. It was just a little bit, well, nope, too late. We're already pulling it. And I went in there and I ran a mile. And when I say I ran a mile, it was, I came in just under the walking pace. I think my first mile that I'd run when I was like 300 some pounds was... Yeah. 18 minutes and 25 seconds. Yeah, that's, the average that's really human bad. walks a mile in, in 20 minutes. Uh, actually, about 15, my friend. <laughs> <sighs> yes. Shut up. <laughs> if, if you're if you're if you're not ambling, if you're walking to get somewhere, uh, average person will walk a mile in about 15 minutes. I was uh, I was Lord, yeah. I was born an ambling man. You sure you weren't running backwards on that trip? Uh, no. I, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. It was bad. And it's taken me uh, a few years to get... I'm not where I want to be. I still kind of hate my body. And that also gives me motivation to go like, no, fuck you. you know, like, well, the supernumerary nipples don't help much <laughs> for healthy body image. My eyes are up here. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, like there's... I don't, I don't know. It's maybe I'll write a book on it one day because there's everybody's got a workout book. Why not? Why don't I write one? I told I told her I said I'm gonna write one. I'm gonna call it Coffee, Water, and Common Sense. There's there's just fucking do it. Like yeah, this fuck you Nike. Just you know get up and do it. Don't allow your brain to even argue with you because you know basic training, the workouts that we did, the running and the push ups, the sit ups, the flutter kicks, and the whole nine yards. After a while. Somebody just yells front lean and rest. A little bit of you kind of jerks and your brain is like, oh, yeah, fuck. A yeah. little bit. It becomes muscle memory. So muscle memory for that was gym, go. And like brain brain was like, what, what are you doing, man? We got, there's beer at home. We, we, we got Totino's pizza rolls. Like, nope, we got to do this first. One thing that, you know, you brought up the basic training and all the workouts and stuff. One, one of the most wonderful things about those workouts as horrible you just had as, no choice <laughs> as they were yeah i mean you had no choice but one of the greatest things that they teach you is how much more you have in you, in you yeah once you think you're you can no longer go oh 
<laughs> you've got, you've boss, got plenty I'm, more. I'm dog tired, and, boss. No, you're not. Yeah. I'll let you know when you are. Exactly. And it, it's amazing. It, it really is amazing how much more you have in you once you get past your own mind. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's a, a great way to sum up this entire conversation. There's always more in the tank than what you think. Yeah. That, once, you, it, once you get past your own brain. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I'm doing now. Um, this this last week, I, I got I, I took all the last week off from working out. I went back in this week and fucking killed it because I still run my mile and I'm consistently getting my mile in though right around the seven eight minute mark like it's I think I ran the yesterday that's it was like mile. 756 that's really yeah, good for, for being almost 40 hell yeah, yeah I'll take it that's really good and then I'll do another mile but I do it at max incline I got that bitch turned up to 15 now hang on so I do 15 max 15 walking for a tenth of a mile and then I go to 10 on the incline do that for a tenth back up to 15 and then go to 9 so it's like 15, 10, 15, 9, 15, 8. By the time I get to the mile mark, it's at like a 7% grade, which is, it feels like flat ground. But it gives you, because I'm in, in my, I, I created it and I justified it in my brain going, you know, you already ran once, you're doing this now. And so it makes it a little bit easier, but you're still getting progressively more tired. So it's still like, first time I did that, another guy was in the gym and like looked at me and was like, are, are you crying? Because I was sweating so much, it was coming off my eyelashes. Nice. Not the brows, it went over my eyes. I went sweat blind and was just, there was a trail of tears on this treadmill. And now, after I get done with that, I level it out, just set it to one. Somebody told me, don't ever let the treadmill sit at zero because it's actually like running downhill. Just a slight downhill grade. So I set it to one. And then I run as fucking hard as I can. I don't think it's a downhill grade. I think it's... I know. Uh, plus... You're never going to get... Plus point one is more than zero. Well, I mean, you're, um, you, you know, if you if you only run treadmill, you will never get that time mm -mm. on concrete, you know, or like tack or, or whatever yeah. like you're running on, uh, because you don't actually have to propel your body forward. No. All you have to do is keep your legs moving. That, that's why that's I like it. the inclines, though, because it, it helps you right. kind of have so to propel yourself. That's, I think that's more what they're trying to say I guess oh, it's set to it's, one is it's almost semantics. equivalent of the road yeah, it's I basically it. overcoming the fact that you don't have to move yourself forward mm -hmm. uh, when I was in the army I could I could blast out a mile on a treadmill in six minutes like no problem but once I got on the track or on the road I want to see a six know, minute mile again in myself I want to get there again and I know I will I had, I had a couple sub six minute miles on on the road myself two of them to be exact i ran a six minute mile once and that was in tech training and we were getting run through the fucking ringer because as air force all they want you to do is be able to run run away <laughs> <laughs> run to the plane <laughs> run to the chow hall <laughs> run to the chow hall. midnight chow yay <laughs> they're giving away office supplies everybody <laughs> run. i want click i want clicky top pins not the twisties <laughs> Son of a bitch! <laughs> oh my god, that's terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, we were—I think we were the only ones that had pen holders in our uh, forearm sleeves. Oh. Go Air well, Force. We didn't have them in, in our forearm sleeves. We actually had them in our breast pockets, mm -hmm. but but you were not allowed to have yeah, one. We, in. Was, we had those. We still had those. You, and then we still they added. It was against pen regulation holders. to have a pen in one. Yeah. Yeah. We we had <laughs> two pen understand. holders on the chest, two pen holders on the left arm, and two pen holders on the right arm. We had pens for days, like. Yeah. We wanted the slanted pockets because my MOS was one of the only ones that still actually went out to a field with a gun. And the uh, the other 90% of the Air Force that flew a desk was like, no, no, we like the flat ones because I can get more like Lorna Dune cookies in there. Why do I need an angled <laughs> pocket? You know, I know. God forbid you got to cross draw something like <laughs> pissed me off. I don't understand why you can't have different uniforms for different uh situations i mean oh, yeah. tankers get to wear those sweet coveralls. really really great nomex suits <laughs> which are really comfy really comfy until till the heat hits them <laughs> well they're not that bad i mean like fire because you know nomex reacts with fire and shrivels up a little bit i think it's they wear them so they don't catch on fire i know like but nomex reacts when it's on fire i had some nomex gloves that i used to wear yeah, i used to have and, a pair of uh, nomex gloves I was cold, and I was out at a bar that had a torpedo heater it's on the... almost like a uh, micro fleece. Oh, it was great, yeah, it was but really nice. I was 
outside on this patio and they had a big torpedo here, those kerosene ones. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm going to warm my hands up. Well, I got the gloves a little too close to it and the Nomex reacted. Yeah, like, it gets crispy. And it like shrunk into my hand. Like it was like, like it, it food saver bagged my hand. We had to cut the glove off. I was like, well, that's great. It's going to keep, I get it. It's there to sacrifice itself for me, but. Maybe you got like an off brand where it's actually like gnome mex. <laughs> yeah, with a G. With a G. No, 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 it was it was issue, but uh, I loved them. I don't know. But yeah, dude, the, the biggest thing that, and this is the last thing I'll say on the whole, hey, let's go get fucking healthy to make ourselves feel better bit was the thing that keeps me going in it. And it's not, it's no big brain, you know, I'm, there's not, not no inspiration in it. And it's not, oh, I got to do this for America. I do this for her. You know, I've already said that kind of stuff, but truly what keeps me going back is the first time that I saw results. It was like, oh, pants are a little looser. You know, that, that really ignites you. You're like, oh, fuck yeah. But now I'm through that and I'm in just a slow burn of losing what it, what's left that I need to lose. So the results aren't really as profound as they were. So I get done and I'm like, oh, well, yeah, scale says I'm up two pounds, blah, blah, whatever. Like, I always just got to tell myself baby steps, baby steps. Every time that I go, I get done, I'm like baby steps because that's what kills a lot of people's want to get in better shape. They, they go, oh, we see the first results, fuck yeah. And then you don't see anything else after it for a while. And then they just quit because they're like, well, I, I guess this is me because I've heard people toss around it. Oh, well, this is your natural weight. You're supposed to be like, no, it's not. You could be fucking 10 pounds if you wanted to. You might have to get some surgeries, but, you know, we can all be as big or as little as we want to be. It's just trying to lose the stuff requires more patience. I mean, don't get me wrong. Get, gain of the weight. God, that was a fun. It's a lot of fun. Fun yeah. journey. <laughs> 5 a.m. at the drive thru to <coughs> McDonald's, get me some double doubles with mayonnaise and bacon. Mm. Be, be surprised how little effort it actually takes. What, the game? Yeah. <laughs> I know, it's. <laughs> but getting older, I'm just like, I, I looked at a cheeseburger today and I heard a button pop somewhere. I was like, oh, God. Oh God. Now, there, there's a book you should write. <laughs> 5 a.m. at McDonald's. Yep. You can have a shirtless dude on the front and it'd be like one of those smut ones, though, you know, for the ladies. I'm going to start reading those for audiobooks. You know, a lady talked me into it. Somebody pulled one up and asked me to read it as, as a joke. And I did it. And they were like, holy shit, you can do this. And I will not repeat the words on this oh show. Because it will get flagged. Oh, boy. <laughs> so, if you're ever in the market for uh, the men that lost their shirts books. Because they're always missing their shirt on the covers. It's I might, have, I might have to borrow this snifter while I read. <laughs> uh, well, you mentioned how, like, when you first noticed you were losing weight. I had a similar situation uh, recently where I, I was, like, I was pretty amped. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I, I guess, uh, you know, haven't been going to the bar as whole, you know, as much. And I was like, man, my, my belt, my belt's nice and loose today and I, I felt good and ain't been the, getting them steins in you yeah well i, I realized <laughs> that um <clears throat> i actually ripped one of the holes back <laughs> back, <laughs> back into the other one be, 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 because my belt my belt's too fucking old <laughs> so that's, a, that's, that's yeah so that's pretty sad I'm not laughing at you. <laughs> Your delivery on that was amazing. <laughs> yeah, so that was disheartening. <laughs> and I still need a belt. But, uh, yeah, that's that. <laughs> I don't even remember what I was going to fucking say now. It was nice when it lasted. <laughs> it's like, man, yeah, I, I, I think I have been looking a little. Oh, shit. <laughs> My fucking belt. Dude, I know once I gave up drinking the, uh, like a lot of the heavy beers and stuff like that and just went to like a Coke Zero and a shitty whiskey mixer, cutting out just that amount of carbs. Good God. Like, I know people that they just gave up drinking beer and they lose 30 pounds. But beer's delicious. I probably could. This is the worst time of year to try to give it up with all the good Oktoberfest coming out. I know. I know, uh, like when I was on the Mothman 
black IPA. Oh yeah, when me and you first met, yeah, because yeah. I was on the IPAs too. That's when I was still three hundo. That's that's a freaking loaf of bread. Yeah, and per Stein. I, I, I used to drink four of them. Me too. Yeah, I was right there with you. <laughs> We're the big chungus brothers. <laughs> My God. Hey Daddy, <laughs> you want to go get some burgers after? You? Why am I sweaty? <laughs> Yeah, and that's when they opened the Popeyes in town too. So that's yeah, a pretty bad combination. <laughs> I'm just waiting for Popeyes chicken paired with a Mothman IPA. My God, I still love those Mothman IPAs. Oh, they're but wonderful. But I, I cannot drink that much anymore. I, I can I can still imbibe as much alcohol, but my stomach will not hold. You're going with the quality over the quantity. I, oh, right now I'm going quantity over quality. <laughs> uh, I still love drinking lots of beers, but uh, <laughs> I'm to the point where it was in my scotch. <laughs> it was in my mouth. Spit it out. Oh, the gnat, not you. Yeah. Oh God. All right. Sorry. Tasty. Oh. That's why I went to those. 64 calorie beers is. At least he dry, died happy. Oh, yeah. It's, you know, he's sanitized. It was in my mouth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to go anywhere with that one. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I say, too. He man. died happy. Yeah, he was <laughs> in my mouth. He was in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> man, I set myself up for that one. No, it's... I mean, I'm with you. I love drinking me the beers too. But yeah, I, I I just can't drink those the heavy like the really heavy beers anymore. Because we know that's I, what they I, do. I still to drink us. Bud Heavy. I mean, you say that now. You wait till but, it gets cold, cold, and winter's here. That's when no, the heavy beers are there at I, their best. I, I can't afford it anymore anyway. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I I miss it. It just I can have one or two of them, but then it, it's just like drink. It's like drinking bread. Well, I'll make sure that I bring some uh, when we go to the Bachelor thing next year. We'll have some of them. Some fancy beers. Fancy beers. Oh, yeah. You think we should get a uh, invest in a keg of something up there? I've had uh, heard some of the guys talking about that. but I was thinking we should get maybe some of that Screech Owl. A keg of Screech Owl? The, what, what's their bold blonde, I think it is. I've never been a fan of that. I think it's pretty good. If you get it fresh out of, uh, like, fresh from the brewery, there, there's very few beers that can top that. That's yeah. a good. That's a good one. Well, speaking of good ones, we're right there at that good time. Oh damn it! Because I'm about to piss my pants. Okay. And I figured it's close enough. All right. Bye, everybody. Well, that was a little premature. Oh. <laughs> Just end it. Right I swear there. that never happens. <laughs> well, guys, it looks like we're all out of time here. So thank you all for uh, sticking here with us and listening to another hour of this glorious, glorious, just fucking NASCAR track that we are <laughs> camped out right next to. So glad I moved right next to the airport. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like that damn Geico commercial or whatever. But anyway, thanks guys so much for stopping by. And until we see you here next time on the show, we hope to find you a little bit happier, healthier, just a little bit best, a little, a little, a little less bitter in life. So until next time, peace out.